Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. Today, we have Matt Warder of Seawolf Research. He's an energy, metals, and mining analyst specializing in coal. Matt has been in the business for 20 years, and today we're going to pick his brain on the subject. Remember to support the show and hit that like button, jumpstart the algorithm, get the word out, and share this video with anyone that you think needs to hear it. Matt, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, I mean, I, I love talking about coal at any point in time, but uh, I really appreciate talking about it with the investor community because, uh, uh, you know, that's that's really who we need to pay attention to the sector now that, uh, you know, it's kind of the, you know, coal is persona non grata amongst investment banks and a lot of hedge funds with ESG mandates and those sorts of things. So good, good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we like about it is uh, politicians hate it right now, but uh, ironically, we're burning more and more of it every year. So <laughs> as far as an investor goes, that's a lot. <laughs> I like it a lot. Um, OK, this is your first time on the show. So uh, maybe just give us a couple minutes of your background and how you got into coal. Uh, sure. Well, uh, the, I got in through the back door for sure. I started off. Um, uh, I was I, I went to college on a baseball scholarship and was gung ho medical school. Uh, moved back home to study for the MCATs and did well. And I'd started a band at the time. And we wound up getting a tour, and I deferred medical school. And uh, you know, we wound up uh, we wound up playing for about ten years. Uh, you know, we signed and dropped a couple of times, but uh, the whole time, the way that we largely supported ourselves in the all time was by teaching. And so I had uh, taught in the school system, and I taught. I had a private uh, guitar instruction studio. And uh, when we came to the end of our career, one of my students. Uh, you know, I was sort of complaining about, well, I don't know what, what we're going to do next. I've been doing this for a long time. And he said, well, why don't you come work for me? And I was, I didn't know quite what I was getting into, but the next week he came in with a, with a, you know, this tome, it's like 270 page thick uh, coal supply study of central Appalachia and a job offer, like a legit job offer. I thought he thought he's like saying, Hey, come make copies for me, but no, no, it's, it's for real. So I, you know, never done it before, but my dad was a coal oil and gas attorney for a long time. So I said, yeah, let's give it a shot. And then, uh, you know, I spent the next two years working from home with him, uh, you know, kind of learning the industry from the ground up, uh, specifically in central Appalachia, which is in, which was incredibly complex. I think there were like 1,200 mines at the time. Now there's more like, you know, 300. Um, so it's been, been a huge, uh, you know, just decline in number of operations. Uh, but it was complicated. Uh, you had, uh, you know, production of thermal coal, which goes to power plants. Uh, you had the, it's the largest producing region of metallurgical coal, which is used to make coke, which uh, reduces iron ore into steel. Um, so I had this really sort of complex region and I was the data analyst for, for a couple of years, did all the, you know, the GIS and mapping work for it. And that's kind of how I, I cut my teeth. A, a few, uh, a few months into my tenure there, uh, the little geological firm that was based here in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, that I was working for got bought by a global consultancy, Wood McKenzie. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that brought a whole other level of, uh, you know, sort of corporate culture on top of it. So I basically went from being a musician to being a corporate coal consultant in a matter of like a few months, which uh, is a baptism by fire, to say the least. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, I've been. So were you studying like uh, Centralia, like that area? Uh, I mean, Central Appalachia is basically like uh, from Charleston, West Virginia, down through bristol tennessee and like that area and then over into uh southwestern virginia and uh in eastern kentucky uh so it's it's basically like those those four regions right there there's a there's a there are deposits of you know very high quality high heat thermal coal and you know with low sulfur content and these metallurgical coals that are um uh, are some of the world's best uh so so that's that's sort of what i cut my teeth on but the you know if you think about how long we've been mining coal in the United States, this is the oldest area of production. So, uh, you know, the, you know, we mined the big seams a long time ago. So these are really sort of like smaller, smaller seam, uh, thinner seam operations. A lot of them are run by mom and pops and contract miners. And the business is just very complex. Some, you know, um, like a, a complex, a mining complex down there will have a centralized preparation plant and maybe draw from as many as like 20 mines sometimes. So the, in order to keep the blend of, uh, you know, qualities the same. So it's a, it's, it's a really interesting and nuanced area. Um, it's, it's one that you have to work in for a long time in order to really understand kind of how, how all the companies sort of interact with other, with each other and, and what the cost structures are like and how they're going to evolve. It's, um, 
Uh, but it's it's also really rewarding in that, you know, I got to learn a lot about met coal really early, which is a, you know, a little bit more complicated coal chemistry. And, and um, you know, it, for me, it was just, uh, it's like it's like putting together pieces of a puzzle. Um, and uh, I, just, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, a few years to assemble that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Maybe we can go over some of the uh, coal 101 basics. Um, some, some of the hive are, are pretty versed in coal and others, including the host, are uh, neophytes. Um, so basically, like whatever coal we have, that's it. It's kind of like oil. This stuff takes 100 million years to make of dead plant life, uh, you know, being compacted by earth. And, you know, um, we're not going to make any more and we're not going to AI our way into more coal. Right. Um, so maybe you can kind of go over met coal, metallurgical coal, and then there's thermal coal. And um, there's a couple different subsets of those. Can you just kind of give us a, a you know, yeah. basics of that? Can do. I mean, there, there are a lot of different subsets. And that, that's what I think is kind of confusing and esoteric about the coal industry. It's that coal isn't just one thing. It's a, it's a lot of different things. Um, let's start with thermal coal, which is, I think, what most people think of when they think of the sector. Uh, thermal coal is is burned in, uh, you know, at power plants to heat water and turn boilers, basically. Um, and how thermal coals are, tend to be classified is they're classified mainly on their heat content. Uh, so, like, you know, benchmark Newcastle coal, which uh, anyone who's, who follows Whitehaven is, is sort of familiar with, is about, you know, 6,000 kilocalories per kilogram or uh, if you're, you know, a U.S., uh, you know, imperial metric, uh, uh, you know, metrics user like I am, you know, about 11,000 uh, BTUs per uh, per pound. Um, you know, there are hotter coals than that. Uh, in Central App, the thermal coals are, you know, call it, you know, 12,000 to 12,500 BTUs per pound. In Northern Appalachia, where Consol, uh, ticker CEIX, produces, um, their coals are upwards of 13,000 BTUs, so very high. Uh, in heat content. But if you move out to the Illinois Basin, that's going to be more, uh, you know, 11,000 BTUs. And then if you go out to the Powder River Basin, where Peabody has a, a large mine there, Arch Resources has a large mine there, those coals range between 8,400 uh, BTUs per pound on the low end to 8,800 BTUs per pound on the high end, which is kind of more comparable to Indonesian thermal coal production. So, so each individual power plant, you know, it sort of relies on one spec and that that spec usually has to do with heat content and then uh, the other is sulfur so okay and is that is that high grade and low grade so like high grade would be eleven thousand and low grade would be eighty four hundred or uh i mean sort of yes i mean lower rank is what we would say okay. there's higher rank coals that have higher heat content uh, and then lower rank coals uh you know uh, that go from bituminous to sub bituminous coals uh that uh, like indonesia powder river basin um, and, uh, and those are, those are lower heat content coals, but sulfur matters as well, because obviously when you burn, you know, a high sulfur coal, it emits sulfur dioxide, which a power plant has to scrub out, uh, you know, of the, of the effluent, uh, otherwise you have, uh, you know, you wind up with acid rain and those yeah. are, you, you try to do <laughs> it's a good way to kill people. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it's a good way to cause a lot of different problems, but, uh, but that's, that's kind of how the thermal coal side of that works. Now, there are some, there are some other, you know, sort of more minor wrinkles. There's some thermal coal that is better for industrial use. Um, we use, um, you know, thermal coal competes with pet coke, for instance, at cement plants in India. Like that's, it's a big part of uh, Consol's uh, uh, revenue, for instance, is exporting uh, thermal coal to India, uh, basically be with pet coke. The Indians really like that. Um, and then there are um, uh, thermal coals used at chemical plants, you know, different types of industrial coals. Um, uh, I, I remember going to visit Eastman Chemical Plant in, uh, in, in Bristol, Tennessee. One particular, uh, you know, very, very specific uh, specification of coal uh, that is really low production. And uh, it just the, the, the individual boilers at each individual plant have limitations on what they can take and you know it's it's uh you know procurement officers don't like to change that up if they don't have to uh but that's that's kind of the thermal coal side do you have any other questions about that or you want me to talk about that uh no basically okay so it goes from like uh 13,000 uh BTUs yeah. per pound all, all the way down to 8,400 each mm -hmm. of these um power plants or heaters, I guess, uh, uh, to produce heat. Um, uh, they take different grades. And so you can't really like go and throw in an 11,000 one into one that's designed for 8,400 right. or you're going to blow that's the thing up, right? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, if it, you can take uh, or blend in uh, other other types of coal, but you have to do that very carefully. Um, there's a there's a metric called ash fusion temperature. If you think about, you know, when you heat up coal, they sort of get uh, there's a period where they sort of become liquid a little bit, and the ash in the in the coals, uh, if they if they liquefy at the same time, they can you know blend together and you get uh, clinker, uh, which is uh, you know if you if you ever tended a furnace in the 1950s. Uh, I didn't, but uh, uh, my grandfather did. And he used to talk about clinkers all the time. Uh, but the, the, those kinds of things can happen in the boiler. And obviously that'll that'll absolutely foul up the work, so to speak. So you have to be careful about that. Okay. All right. And then metallurgical coal, also called met coal for short or coking coal. Um, yes. can, that's used to make steel, correct? Yeah. So, so metallurgical coal has a special rheological property that when you heat it in the absence of oxygen, it actually holds its shape. Uh, so instead of most thermal coals, like if you heated them in the absence of oxygen, they turn to dust. Uh, metallurgical coal actually makes charcoal, uh, for for lack of a better turn of phrase. But um, so we use those to make pure carbon or coke, as we call it. Um, and then that coke, which is pure carbon, if you can think of an iron a molecule of iron ore FeO2, that carbon picks off one of the oxygens of Fe of the solid FeO2 and turns it into molten FeO. And because the coke is strong enough to hold up, you know, this layer of iron ore over the top, that metal, which is now liquid, will trickle down in through the, uh, you know, the gaps in the in the coke all the way down to the bottom of the furnace. And then uh, you can do what's called a tap uh, where you poke a hole basically in the bottom and you siphon off all the metal uh, until you get to the impurities, which we call slag. You try to keep those out. Um, and then you take that that liquid metal and then you blow oxygen over top of it in a basic oxygen furnace. That picks off the other O from, and then you're left with molten Fe. Cast that out into slabs and then roll it into whatever it is that you want to make. But yeah, the the, the metallurgical coal serves as both the fuel, uh, so it's what gets hot and stays hot and keeps the furnace hot. Um, but it also serves as the reductant uh, for iron ore. So it's a special, uh, very specialized industrial coal that has. Uh, sort of limitations on how how you can blend them together, so to speak. But that's that's the basic uh, concept of it. Now okay. the class the classifications are mostly done on what we call volatile content. When you heat it up, when you heat coal up in the oven, that volatile matter gets gets thrown off and will go into the atmosphere. And we catch it in a bag house. Uh, you have a bag that sits over top of it. We catch all the impurities that come up and try to precipitate out. Uh, you know, any impurities, but that's, um, so we have three types of basic coals in the U.S. There's low volatile coal, which is basically zero to call it 22% volatile matter. There's mid volatile coal from 22 to 28% volatile matter. And then anything above that, we consider high volatile coal. Uh, there are two types of high volatile coals. There's high vol A and high vol B. Um, high vol A has a reflectance, uh, which is another, you know, geological test above one, uh, high vol B has a reflectance below one. That just means like uh, above one is a stronger coking coal comparatively. Uh, below one is a is a weaker one, uh, and the weaker ones obviously get a discount. Um, and in general, in the past, we used to give a discount uh, on price based off of that volatile content. So if the difference is like fifteen percent, then high vol would get a fifteen percent discount. That's changed over the years because we've run out of these really good quality reserves. And so now high vol A's are so important in Europe and Brazil that they basically get about the same price, sometimes more than lower volatile coals, which is kind of an interesting uh, price dynamic. So that's that's the United States. All right, let's go over to Australia now. Let's talk about coal qualities over there. The, the primary uh, benchmark that they use is uh, PLV or what's called premium low volatile. coal. So we still have the low vol classification system, uh, but now we start to introduce some other terminologies, right? So uh, in, in Australia, they have uh, hard coking coal, uh, which is the, you know, the PLV type. Uh, they have semi-soft coking coal, which is, has much weaker coking coal characteristics. Uh, you know, they, they don't hold their, their shape quite as well, but you can blend them into lower costs in a blend. They have, um, they're sort of used analogous to how high volatile coals are in the US, although they can, they can be mid-vol, they can be different specs, right? Uh, and then we have soft coking coals, which are even weaker than that, that are usually priced up from thermal. And then the the last sort of category that, that I should probably mention is called uh, PCI, which is pulverized coal injection. And so PCI is used as a coke replacement. 
So instead of if you if you wanted to save money on coke, which can get really expensive, you can grind up uh, you know PCI and use that as both fuel and the reductant, and you can inject that to save money on on coke. Uh, Europe is the primary region that, that that uses the most of it. Um, obviously, with with European steel production down, uh, you know, here over the last few years, they they've been using less. Uh, Russia is the main uh, was the main supplier into Europe, so that market's kind of gotten messed up, uh, you know, over the over the last few years. But um, in in general, those are the different qualities, right? Low vol, mid vol, high vol in Australia, PLV uh, they have mid vol too. But you also introduce semi soft and soft coking coals. Uh, and then, and then everybody uses uh, pulverized coal injection or PCI to some degree. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because that's all a lot to take in. It's part of what makes the sector difficult to, uh, I think, for folks to approach. Which is exactly why we have you on the show, Matt. Uh, okay, so so Met Coal, there's as as I heard you about three different types yeah. or variations: well, yeah. hard, mm -hmm. soft, and semi-soft, and then right. PCI coal. And uh, PCI coal can be used uh, to substitute uh, in to some degree into med coal just simply because it's cheaper. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. And then and then the volatile content, low, mid, and high. Low, mid, and uh, high. In, in general, like a steel plant will try to hit a mid volatile target. Um, back in the early days of the steel industry, uh, uh, you know, in, like when Andrew Carnegie founded U.S. Steel, um, they'd use almost exclusively mid volatile coal. So we mined those those reserves out. In West Virginia, in Virginia, a long time ago. So then they have to, they have to start blending low volatile and high volatile coal to sort of make a midpoint uh, blend, if you will. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go over some of the fundamentals of coal, and um, you know what uh, we we know it's politically incorrect, but uh, each year that goes by, we seem to be using more and more coal, despite what our big thinkers you know want us to use less. Uh, so as a uh, as an investment guy and as, as a as a uh, investor, uh, this is uh, this is pretty interesting to us, and and we feel like we may be at a uh, sweet spot here where uh, it's hated, but yet we're using more. You know, can you kind of go into the uh, fundamentals of that? Sure. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's pretty interesting. How I would sort of describe it is, uh, for, first off, I would say most of the of the focus from a regulatory perspective is really on thermal coal. Because when we think about carbon emissions, uh, you know, it's it's mostly power plants uh, that, that I think come to mind. You know, I forget what the what the total percentage of of global emissions are for power, but it's a lot. You compare that to the steel industry, I think steel is like somewhere between five and eight percent of global emissions. So it's just it's just not as as big an impact. Uh, so uh, and that's one of the uh, one of the issues I think that med coal producers have struggle to communicate to the public uh, and to the banking industry over time is just like, hey, we're not we're not exactly the same thing. I, I think you know you just look at coal and you put everything in one category, but that's not it's not necessarily uh, you know fair or just to do. Um, but uh, the, the the interesting thing to me on the on the regulatory side is we basically decided as a Western culture that we don't want to burn uh, we don't want to make any more coal fired power plants. And, and to be truthful, like we're not really going to do it anyway, because it costs about twice as much to build a coal fired plant as it does to build a gas fired plant. And we're, we're producing a lot of gas. So from an economic standpoint, that writing was on the wall way before, you know, any regulatory uh, body ever, ever got a hold of it. As soon as the fracking revolution came on, uh, you know, the, the, the writing was on the wall, let's just say. So but but when you decide to do that from a policy perspective and you begin to force plant retirements, and then you wind up in a situation, think about uh, uh, the winter storm that hit Texas a few years ago. Um, and, and so natural gas is an interesting commodity in that it, it doesn't just go to the power sector, it goes to a lot of different sectors, right? It goes to, you know, it makes hydrogen, you can, uh, you know, make petrochemicals out of it, but it also goes to home heating. And when you have a situation like they had in Texas, uh, where, you know, everything gets cold, well, the natural gas preferentially goes to homes first and the power plants second. And if the supply of gas is not sufficient to to generate enough power to offset that that lull in you know or that that drag in in wind and solar, then you need to have other kinds of base load backup. In this case, if you don't have nat gas, then you need either coal or nuclear uh, to back that up from a base load perspective. And if you don't have either of those, then you have to run diesel generators. So that that's the that's the one problem from a uh, you know from a regulatory perspective is it doesn't. We, we've pulled the grid potentially out of balance if you look forward, 
you know, five or 10 years to just being able to reliably supply customers. And I, I think that's something that when forced to, you know, regardless of one's political position, when you're forced to reevaluate that, uh, you know, when, when something breaks, you'll, you'll probably come to the right decision. So I, I'm a little bit optimistic that we'll allow coal-fired generation off in the future. I just, I don't think we're going to build many more plants. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the annual demand for thermal coal is about a billion tons per year. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, the, the increase in demand is mainly coming from China and India. Uh, India is really the next the next big demand center. China's growth has, has stopped, but um, China's has replaced domestic production with some imports from Mongolia, with imports from Russia, uh, and probably soon uh, they're going to have to import uh, a little bit from, I suspect, from Australia and from the from the other higher higher volume suppliers. Um, the but while demand is growing, it's not it's not really growing that fast. The real issue is supply. Like if you think about when we've from a regulatory perspective, when we force down demand here domestically, well, the supply that that used to uh, you know, go into those plants, when it goes away, it doesn't come back. So if you have a situation where demand, you know, moves up past what the cost curve can actually provide, you have situations like we had, uh, you know, in 2021 and 2022, where, you know, the price can go, you know, astronomically, because your, your marginal, your marginal ton is basic, is, is effectively infinity, whatever somebody's willing to pay for that. And that's, that is the, I think, probably what's going to wake people's eyes up if we ever have another, you know, shortage like that on the coal side, um, because the the supply angle is not changing at all, uh, whether whether we're talking about thermal or net. Very very little material coming on. Okay, that's kind of the same narrative that we've seen play out with uranium over the last few years, which yes. I think is one of the reasons why we're attracted to this sector. Is it's a is this the next uranium, you know? Um, uh, okay. And then uh, real quick, uh, Met Coal annual mm -hmm. demand per year is about 300 to 330 uh, tons per year? A uh, million tons, yeah. A million uh, tons. Okay. Yeah. On, on, the, on the seaboard market, there's there's some domestic production as well that stays home, uh, you know, in every major steel producing region. But uh, on the seaboard market, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. And, and you've mentioned uh, India a couple of times now. And... Um, uh, wh where do you see the demand coming from in coal? Is it both uh, met coal and thermal, or or do you see more thermal, or what what do you see? I mean, the, there's going to be a little bit of thermal coal growth in India. There's going to be a little bit of thermal coal growth in China, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, call it in general, uh, over time. Uh, but that's going to be offset by declines in the United States and in Europe, basically in developed markets. This is a uh, the energy transition is. You know whether we like to you know acknowledge it or not is really a developed markets versus a developing markets phenomenon. So the developed markets are going to transition as best as they can. Uh, the developing markets are going to use you know the lowest cost of energy uh, available to continue to get uh, you know uh, to continue to advance up the socioeconomic level. Um, so that's you know that I think is a given regardless of uh, what John Kerry may have to, may have to say on the matter. Uh, <laughs> you know reality has a way of uh, pushing through, uh, you know, regardless of one's uh, ideological assumptions. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically um, and we had Rick roll on the show a little bit ago and we were talking about coal and he said, uh, uh, I, I forget the exact percentages, but it was something like 15 or 16% of the world's population doesn't have any electricity. I mean, so That's they can't, right. they can't even store food for an extended period of time unless That's it's right. salted uh, because they, they can't even have a refrigerator. And um, what, what you're saying is basically those developing countries are going to start consuming coal because it's the cheapest way for them to produce electricity, period. And uh, the developed countries are going to use less uh, of that and probably more um, hydro and gas and, and nuclear. Um, do you see the developing markets consuming uh, at a rate faster than than the developed uh, markets are going to are going to stop using it? Uh, for, yeah, I mean, if you look out at the the demand curve going forward, I mean, it, it goes up and to the right. It just doesn't go up as up as it's not at a forty five degree angle. It's like a five degree angle. Um, so that that kind of incorporates the offsets that we have in the West. Um, it's it's not growing at a, at a at a huge pace, but it's growing fast enough relative to the available supply that you can look out five, 10 years and see that we're in trouble from a, from just a, a match of quality perspectives uh, at the very least. So it's, you know, although this, you know, this, this run over the last few years in the stocks have been 
pretty violent. Um, you know, there's still, I mean, there's still multiple years left in this trade uh, as long as policymakers continue along the, the path that they're currently on. Okay. All right. Um, and going into, so the biggest countries that are going to be consuming more and more of this are going to be India and China. Yeah. And really India now becomes the big driver, particularly of, of net coal. Um, that's, uh, you know, I think India, let me see, India's uh, this year, I think is expected to import uh, about 70 million tons, but by 2027, that's going to be 81. That's a okay. difference of, you know, pl plus 10 million. <laughs> Plus 10 million tons. There, there are some declines elsewhere, um, but but by and large, uh, you know that's. I don't think we're going to see that much coal come into the market over that. And that's that's really what the concern is. When demand gets so far ahead of supply that it can't keep up, uh, you know, then then we have potential for for prices to move up materially from where they are. Okay. Okay. And one company that you can see benefiting from that simply because they export to them a lot is Console. Uh, yeah, well, Consol is a thermal coal provider. Uh, so, oh. and, and I mentioned industrial coal. They, they they sell a little bit of met coal from their Idman complex in central Appalachia. Uh, they have the potential to sell at any point in time a little bit of met coal from Bailey, which is one of the mines at their Pennsylvania mining complex, into the met market. They do sell industrial coal to the cement producers uh, in India. Uh, so they they have some higher than higher than normal thermal coal uh, prices, and and then the the remainder they sell as thermal coal either domestically, uh, mostly into the PJM power market, or the remainder is exported to, you know, combo of Europe and Brazil and a few other countries. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Let's, uh, you know what, let me bring up the charts right here. And so anyone that's not familiar with it, uh, you'll be able to see uh, the kind of violent moves that, uh, that we're talking about here. Okay. So this is Newcastle. This is basically following um, mm -hmm. thermal coal, correct? Uh, yeah, that is thermal coal. That's the the kind of benchmark high high calorific value uh, thermal coal in the world. Okay, all right. So we'll go back as far as trading view will allow us here, and uh, we can see this this is twenty twenty uh, uh, two right here. Just a monumental spike, I guess, thanks to COVID. Um, no, that is the combination of uh, we natural gas prices got incredibly high, and so. Uh, uh, utilities were forced to switch back to thermal coal at a time where they didn't expect it, and uh, there was no there was no available supply in the market. So so that you know spot prices went up to I mean close to five hundred dollars. Yeah, if not if not above five hundred dollars at the uh, you know in late twenty twenty one, and then in twenty twenty two we had the war in Ukraine. So once uh, we put sanctions on Russia, where Russia was no longer able to export, I think they exported um, you know call it the 10 million tons of, of pulverized coal injection uh, to steel plants and, you know, another 20 million tons or something like that, or 15 of, of high CV thermal coal. Well, there's no, there's nowhere you can go in the world and find a replacement for that. So the scramble of, of supply chains kind of forced that, uh, you know, that price, which, you know, normally would I think be call it, you know, somewhere between 80 and a hundred dollars in the before times uh, all the way up to 500. And now we've had so much cost inflation from central bank stimulus, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, the run up in diesel prices, the run up in labor, uh, you know, that I think the floor of this, um, you know, of this uh, of Newcastle prices is probably somewhere around the 110 to 115 dollar range. I think we'll kind of get down and bounce around there. Um, and then depending on what gas prices do from there, uh, determine whether we go up or down. That's interesting because that kind of lines up with a nice little technical uh, back support right uh, back here uh, as it, a technician. I can't help but notice that. <laughs> uh, well, I have I, I have the same chart up here where I comment on that. Like the uh, what used to be the top end of the of the price range is now kind of the bottom end. Yeah. Uh, part of that part of that is accidental, but um, you know part of it, as any technical analyst will tell you, uh, is a you know kind of a self fulfilling prophecy too. In this case, it's supported by the cost curve itself. So there's a fundamental reason. For it to bounce off of that level, obviously it can dip down below. Yeah. If it stays there before too long, you'll see cutbacks in production, and then the price goes back up. Um, you know, to to quote Rick, who I who I used to write a newsletter with a while back, you know, low prices are the cure for low prices, and yes. high prices are the cure for high prices, right? <laughs> yep. Okay, and this is uh, this is Met Coal right here, so we can see the price is uh, essentially tripled, uh, well, maybe doubled from where they are now, but. Uh, um, what uh, what do you see with uh, happening here with Metcol? 
Well, it's it's really the same thing. Like you can see, uh, you know, the the COVID dip in 2020, and then uh, if you think about the steel industry, um, well, if you think if you think utilities are kind of a, a sluggish industry, uh, then you have you haven't seen nothing on steel. Steel like shuts down, everything grinds to a halt, and then when it starts back up, you have to restart all the supply chains. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of moving parts to get you know raw materials uh, to the plants and because there weren't, wasn't really any mine production because nobody knew when, when plants were going to restart, there just wasn't any coal available. Um, and a lot of those mines are still, uh, you know, out of production. Uh, you know, Australia production, I think, uh, fell by, I call it, you know, 15, 20%. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's going to come back. I mean, there's, there's so much, uh, you know, labor issues that, uh, you know, trying to find miners to, uh, you know, to work there, you know, the cost has, has gone up a lot. So there's just, um, you know, the, the, the entire cost curve has gone up by, I mean, fifty percent in the middle. Wow. Uh, pro probably, probably more like seventy-five percent over the past two years. Okay. And what what do you see as the floor here? Um, it's uh, it's probably easier to to show you on uh, on on my screen if you want if you want me to share. For oh yeah, so, let's do it. Yeah. So let me let me share my screen. I'll come up here to this cost curve. This is from Tech's um, this is from Tech's uh, presentation on the Elk Valley uh resources the coal spin out that they did okay. um this was um this was pulled from a cost curve from wood mckenzie for my old company and they highlighted you know the 2020 cost and the 2022 cost at the 50th percentile level and at the 90th percentile level historically the 90th percentile level has been kind of the, the floor price for for coal um but you can see like it went from the middle the midpoint went from 84 to 146 and the you know the top end went from 111 to 171. Hmm. So this this 171, if you you know move this up to you know 2023, where costs are up about five to six percent across the board, um, I wind up with and let me scroll over here. Uh, I've sort of pulled it out there. I wind up with a, a 90th percentile cost this year of about 186 dollars per ton. Now, uh, in the past, uh, that would incentivize new production to come on. Uh, a level like that, but now we, do, you know, mines don't really have access to capital. So in order to incentivize, you know, prices to come on, you have to bake in profit into this, like at least you know, 15, 20%. And if you add 20% to this, uh, you get right around 223. Which uh, if I stop sharing now and then open up the, um, I'm sorry, uh, Matt, that was Met Coal or that was Thermal? That was that was Met Coal. Okay. And then uh, if I share the, uh, you know, the same same price that you were looking at, here's the Met Coal price curve right those hot previous highs that you talked about yeah but look here look here where it bottomed out bottomed out right at like 226 huh. so you know the 90th percentile cost plus 20 percent profit this is i think kind of where the floor of the market is obviously we can dip down a little bit lower uh you know for but it, it's it can't really stay down there for long if we start to lose production so i, I think of the met coal range going forward as between you know when 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 restocking season happens, which generally is early in the year, like, you know, March, February, and then later in the year, you know, August, September, October, um, you know, I think we could probably get back up to 400 without without too much trouble uh, when everybody's in the market at the same time. And then, you know, in the off season, you know, we're going to head back down to call it 260, 270, maybe as low as 225 or 200. But I think we stay between 200 and 400. Uh, for, you know, ostensibly, uh, you know, the foreseeable future. Okay. So if we're in the low 300s right now, you could see uh, some weakness coming into the, into the coal market to bring it back. Yeah. Up. Yeah. We, we, we could see, we could see a pullback in January. I mean, there, there are some fundamental things happening right now. There's a, um, there's a cyclone uh, that's headed right for the, 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 the Met coal ports in Australia right now. So uh, that's part of the reason why I think AMR and, and uh, alpha metallurgical resources and warrior Met coal have been off to the races here this morning. Is uh, I think people kind of anticipating uh, some some weather delays, uh, you know, potentially in Australia. We'll we'll see how that progresses. But um, uh, in in general, I, I think you know two hundred to four hundred is a pretty reasonable expectation. If you if you force me to take a stand on, I'd say we'll probably see more time below three hundred than above it. Uh, but you know, so we'll call it like two fifty two sixty five, kind of where I see the long term, you know, actual price hanging out. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's kind of my view of, uh, you call, call it through the end of the decade. And from there, we'll have to see how other things develop.
Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to some listener questions here. Sure. Uh, Nick and a lot of other people asked about uh, BHP just sold their Met Coal assets to Whitehaven. Um, what um, what do you see with that deal? Was that uh, great for Whitehaven? Great for BHP? What the well, it's it's great for BHP in the sense that they get some of the uh, you know some some mines off the books. You know, BHP wants to transition away from coal. I think over the longer term, I don't think they've really um, they haven't said exactly you know what the pace is going to be. But when they get opportunities to sell, they're going to try to. For for Whitehaven, you know, the 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 get there is they've diversified themselves away from thermal coal. You know, the the cost structure for Met Coal is going to be supportive of high prices for a long time. The cost structure of thermal coal, because it competes with natural gas, is a little bit less certain, I think, going forward. So for Whitehaven, I like the deal because it diversifies them away. I think from a from a profit perspective, they're going to be more like 50-50 now, uh, you know, thermal versus Met, maybe, maybe even a little bit more tilted toward Met. Uh, and and also with the potential to, you know, to pick up pick up more operations later. So I, I think this is a this this is an interesting move for them. Um, you know, we can probably debate the price that they paid, but, you know, looking at my outlook for, for Metcoal there, um, you can, I think you can justify the, you know, kind of the extra, you know, bonuses that are, that are potentially paid in over time, just as a call option on Metcoal, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, BHP felt they could capture a little bit of that, you know, should they have a bumper year in the next uh, two or three? I don't think that's too reasonable to ask for in exchange for vendor financing. Um, because, you know, banks aren't really, you know, proven they're not going to step in and do these deals. So I like it for Whitehaven. Um, I like it for, uh, I like it for BHP. I thought it worked out pretty well for them. We saw basically the same thing in, in Tech and Glencore or something similar. Um, I think this is the new way that, you know, if the majors need to move on from uh, from coal or the, the larger diversified miners, this is the way they're going to have to do it. And I think it's, I think it's good for, you know, the up and coming companies. Okay, um, let's take a look at Whitehaven real quick. Uh, I just drew in some horizontal lines here, uh, but um, what do you think they're going to be able to continue um, their uh, their dividends after this deal, or are they going to have to uh, suspend those? You think for a bit? Uh, honestly, I haven't I haven't updated my model here with my current forecast, so it's hard to say. But yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're definitely going to have some payments here, you know, due over the short term, where the, where they may need to uh, where they may need to reduce those. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't done all the math on it yet, but I, you know, that's, that's probably a risk in my mind. That's less of a concern for me. I'm more concerned with, you know, where are the underlying profits coming on and like how, how in the money or out of the money are the, are the mines going forward. And, and at least in, in my models that I have so far, you know, both of them, uh, you know, the, the deal is accretive in a few years. Um, and, and again, anchors them onto a, onto a price curve that is, you know, I think far more stable and much higher going forward. Okay. All right. You're not worried about the uh, dividends. You're, uh, <laughs> you're focusing on the big picture. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see Whitehaven in an environment where they can lever a little bit more. To, that is, that is just going to be a more stable market going forward. And you have to have very, 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 very low costs in order to like console, for instance, in order to really compete um, at the, you know, over the longer term uh, in, in thermal. Okay, you also um, alluded to it, and we got uh, quite a few people all asked. Uh, Frank Simon and uh, Lanko asked about um, thoughts on Glencore and their deal with Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought Tech should have said yes at the outset, to be frank, because the, the, those those operations in Canada are world class. I mean, it's like eight billion dollars in uh, in net income, I think. Uh, I mean, it's three quarters of their uh, three quarters of their profit, which, uh, you know, if it were me, I never would have let go of the assets anyway. But obviously they're chasing the ESG multiple and they think that once the coal assets are gone, they'll be, you know, kind of comparably valued. I, I think we'll see. We'll see if that's if that actually winds up being the case for Glencore. Uh, it's a, it's a steal, really. You know, you get some of the some of the best assets on the planet, uh, you know, in into the best trading house on the planet. Uh, and and you have what I think is going to be a really really pretty excellent long term operations. I think I think you can probably have a debate as to you know how good an operator Glencore is going to be. I think that's probably a legitimate criticism, but um, you know I, I think it's the most logical landing place for uh, you know assets of that size and valuation. 
Uh, there's just really no other game in town. They're they're the they're the only ones who are willing to take on the the ESG risk at all. So so I think it makes a lot of sense for both companies. Um, and I'm a I'm a huge huge fan of the assets. We'll see how Glencore trades going forward. Uh, there's obviously a lot of capital that, that goes to tech here, you know, in the in the in the near term. But obviously over the longer term, uh, I love the deal. Okay. Okay. Um, and as far as Glencore, uh, where are we? There we are. Uh, okay. Yeah. So they just did this deal, right? I mean, it, it wasn't uh, too long ago. And um, do you kind of see the same thing I do technically here on the charts? Uh, these arrows would be entry points if it even reached it. Uh, yeah. I mean, so Glencore historically is kind of like, you know, plundered along with Copper Beta. Uh, let me see if I can... Oh, okay. Yeah, they're like the fifth largest depositor or something, aren't they? Yeah. So, let's see if I can find a way to normalize that. Um, uh, but yeah, if, if you put up, like, go ahead and add the copper price in, into that chart there if you can. Oh, uh, I don't know how to do that. Can you do that on your? Uh... Oh, I can do. It. I can do. It. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I'll share. I'll I just share. got Trading View. I moved over from another uh, software, and I'm still learning okay. how to use it. So here it is. I mean, so Glencore and Copper you know, sort of traded along with each other here. You know. Oh pretty, my God! Look at that. Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and then here, you know, after they've, uh, uh, you know, after they announced the deal, they sort of come down. You know, Copper finally uh, moved down after that. It's not a. It's not a. You know, it's probably a correlation most of the time in the seventies or something. Um, Tech sort of did this too, and then of course when they report and coal would outperform, you know, that would be a huge earnings surprise. So the the ability to to play. Uh, uh, you know, uh, bad analyst estimates, uh, you know, and tech is gone. That's going to be pretty sad for me. But, uh, but yeah, Glencore sort of traded along with copper. What I'm interested to see is whether that, that relationship is going to change, um, you know, now that they, they have these assets that are, that are thrown into the mix as well. I don't, I don't know if it will, but um, uh, at, at the very least, uh, I think that the correlation might start to break down a little bit more, you know, move down into the forties uh, and then, it's it's still going to be associated with copper. It's just we'll we'll see how much the the finances are driven by net coal or how much the, the trading interest is driven by net coal over the next year or so. Okay, interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay attention to that. That's a that's a neat uh, pattern there. Um, okay, uh, Whitehaven. Okay, thoughts on the Cleveland Cliffs deal with U.S. Steel? Yeah, I mean. It's it's a it's a reasonable it's a reasonable offer the one that they first made uh, but I don't think I don't think U.S. Steel is going to accept it unless we hear you know forty forty two uh, you know forty three dollars a share somewhere up in there I think that's probably where a deal gets done um, but uh, as far as I know right now uh, Arcelor Mittal is still in the mix and and I if if I were to bet that's kind of who I think winds up uh, with the assets. And uh, interestingly, it's kind of it'd be a coup for for Arcelor to get them. Uh, they because Arcelor sold their U.S. assets to Cliffs, which had these you know these massive union liabilities, which are on Cliffs' balance sheet now. And if they came in and and uh, and snapped up U.S. Steel, which does not have that liability problem, Arcelor winds up basically with the same kind of capacity they had before uh, with a with a company that's transitioning over to to EAF and is getting a lot greener, uh, you know, from a comparative perspective. Uh, and they they ditch the liabilities. I, I think that'd be that'd be really interesting to see, and uh, would probably uh, uh, you know, Ms. Uh, Uprezado Senor Lorenzo Gonzalez would not like that so much. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. Johnny asks. Uh, okay, we kind of saw this in uranium. You know, it was hated, and then now we're starting to see some institutional money coming into it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the form of uh, buying up Cameco and, and ones that they can actually purchase. And Johnny wants to know, I find a lot of value in coal stocks. However, will the large institutions and super funds buy into coal stocks with their need to be green? Would love to hear Matt's take on this. Uh, that's a good question. And I, I don't know, because you're essentially asking, a, it's sort of, it's, I don't want to say it's a political question, but it's a people question. Are people going to accept it Going forward, is that going to be okay to to hold? Um, you know, I think from uh, you know from the funds perspective, from the you, you have to think about the the LPs and the shareholders. And, uh, uh, are 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 those people going to allow uh, you know those entities to to do it? I mean, it, that's a tough question. I don't know if uh, you know coal is going to be able to shake its um, uh, 
uh, you know, sort of anti-ESG image enough for that to happen. Uh, however, um, I do think that over time, uh, th there's going to be enough money made in the sector that it's going to force the hands of some folks to pay attention to it, who is constrained from a mandate perspective. Now, whether that's, you know, private money or public money, um, I think is yet to be seen. But I, I do think you'll see, um, maybe not in Australia, uh, just because I think assets would be too hard to insure. Uh, but at least in the U.S., I think you'll see the appetite for, you know, a project or two here or there to come online. Um, I think you'll see some some restarts, uh, you know, in other areas of the country. Uh, I think a few of the, you know, maybe one or two of the projects in Canada comes online. I think you'll see a little bit over the next 10 years. It's just, I, I haven't, I haven't had a conversation quite yet uh, with anyone who you know works in a, in a professional setting at the at the fund level uh, or or the I bank level that's you know kind of big and well known that is quite willing to pull the trigger. Like mostly, you know, I see it show up in like you know Renaissance Technologies and like the you know the Algo funds and Fidelity and stuff like that. You know the big merchant banks or um, uh, you know the big you know the, the bigger holders of ETF, ETF companies and those sorts of things. That's kind of who has it right now? Um, I don't know. We'll call it the say. Let's say it's a coin flip. I think it's a coin flip as to whether or not we see the you know the big money sort of move in, uh, uh, you know, going forward. Okay. Um, now, if okay, if that, most of our listeners are going to want to uh, play the beta in coal. So um, uh, probably Glencore is is one of the core positions. Uh. I, I don't know. Um, Glencore is diversified, so there's a lot of moving parts there. So if you're constructing a coal portfolio, I would I would probably think that like the diversified should held a, you know, a lower max percentage or something like that. Um, you know, really, I kind of think about it. Uh, it's probably again easier to show than to tell. Yeah. You know, I think I think about it in in a few, uh, in a few clumps, right? So here are the Met companies, right? The primary Met companies. There's Alpha Metallurgical Resources, uh, you know, up 85% in the last year. Here's, uh, you know, uh, Warrior Warrior Med Coal up 55% in the last year. Ramico Resources up 89%. Most of this here over the past month when they had that Rare Earth uh, article come out in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, more on that later. Um, you know, Arch is up 13% uh, year on year. I think there's some value in Arch. I think Arch needs to catch up. A little bit. Um, you know, they, they've instituted a buyback that's similar to what AMR is and, and consoles is. I, th I think Arch Arch can really catch up. And down here at the bottom is is Coronado. Now Coronado has an asset in Australia, which is which is kind of a drag on their earnings, the, the Cura mine. Uh, but the Buchanan mine in the U.S. is is pretty fantastic operation. And if we have another like absolute blowout, um, you know, blowout, you, you know, med coal spike here over the next two or three years, which uh, I, I mean. Could happen uh, if the cyclone hits Queensland and those ports get shut down for a month. You know that could happen. Um, without Cura producing, uh, there's actually more torque in Coronado, so you might see Coronado pop up and have a better quarter without Cura operating. Ironically, um, so uh, and I should probably add. There's one other one I should put in here. This is like the very micro cappy way to sort of think about coal. This is Corsa. Of course, it is a small producer in northern Appalachia, a little bit, a little bit higher sulfur, low volatile med coal. Um, but uh, they, they didn't have great settlements for next year. But if you have a med coal spike, they do sell about, call it a third of their production on the spot market. Um, and so if spot prices really spike, their their average return is going to uh, going to go up pretty materially. So they've uh, they they had a they had a settlement which uh, you know allowed them to you know, make, begin to make moves to eliminate their debt. And they were up as much as 325% this year. Uh, that's fallen back after they, you know, signed their contracts at almost a break-even level. Uh, but if they get their costs under control and they can they can sell into a strong spot market in 24, uh, of course it could be really sneaky, uh, you know, if you're looking for for torque. But, I mean, for, for me, I'm mostly positioned here and here, mostly okay. Alpha uh, and Warrior Medical. Warrior has one of the, one of the best projects coming online, uh, here over the next few years, Blue Creek, that is a high ball A mine. Um, Alpha is a behemoth, you know, 16 million tons of production, a uh, mix of uh, low vol, mid vol, and, and, and high vol A. Not much high vol B from there. 
Um, Arch is about 80% met coal, I think, by revenue. Uh, they do have some some risk out in the PRB, which uh, for thermal coal, which I do think is going to have a rough 2024. But uh, the net coal asset should be producing should be producing well. Uh, and again, Coronado, if um, you know if Australia goes down, uh, there might be some interesting upside for that. But this is uh, I should probably put Stanmore in here as well. Uh, Stanmore pulled back um, here pretty significantly recently. Right? This this big move down here. Okay, uh, but I think Stanmore is a, is another one that we can we can throw into the mix for uh, uh, you know to to think about holding if um, if prices go up from that. Okay, um, keep, keep keep that up for just one sec. Okay, so your two uh, kind of beta plays that you like are Alpha and Warrior, and then mm -hmm. Corsa is a I, I haven't heard of that one. What's their market cap? Oh, tiny, uh, forty million, fifty oh, wow. million, okay, something like that. Okay. They they produce a million about a million one point two million tons a year. Uh, it's low vol. It gets a little bit of discount relative to the rest of the U.S. Um, but it's a it's a it's a sneaky low vol met option that I think is out of the woods with regard to uh, you know risk of of not being able to pay off their debt. Um, it's just a question of can they keep costs under control and can they execute uh, and sell spot tons at higher prices uh, than their than their domestic contracts, which were signed at a not so great level. Sure. Okay. So, okay. We'll so see. they're tiny. They're producing uh, one third of one percent of the planet's yeah, yeah. met coal. <laughs> tiny. <laughs> Lot, lots of room for growth, though. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then on the thermal coal side, you know, here in the U.S., we have Consol up forty-seven percent on the year. If you're gonna, if I'm gonna hold a thermal coal stock, this is probably the one that I hold. Okay. Um, uh, I have a little bit that I've that I've already. It's kind of a zero cost position for me. Yeah. That I just, I don't I don't even look at anymore. Just, yeah, you uh, sold. Uh, what is it? Past the point of concern. <laughs> yeah, um, you know both a, both Alpha Metallurgical Resources and Consol. Uh, Monish Pabrai. I don't know if you follow Monish, but uh, Monish moved in pretty significantly into uh, into both AMR and CEIX over the past year, and he's been he's been holding along with all of us. But you notice, like Thermal Coal really hasn't had a good year. If we come down to Alliance Resource Partners, you know, ARLC, down seven point six. Yeah. Yeah, seven point six percent for the year. Um, uh, who's this? This is Yan Coal down thirteen percent. Um, uh, you know, for for Yan Coal, I, you can make the case that the bottom is probably in. They do have a big dividend. Um, you know, it's a little bit more interesting, I think, than others. But it's, I mean, we're talking really, really, uh, you know, kind of low priced, uh, you know, low cost operations. Uh, it's, I, I don't, I don't see a lot of price upside, you know, for, for this quality coal here next year. Okay. And, we got a lot of questions on Yan coal actually. So, but you don't see, um, a, uh, a, a whole lot of upside for that one. And I don't think their dividends at risk or anything like that, which is really why you own them. Um, yeah. but I, I don't really see any material upside. Uh, you know, if you own it at this point, I think you just own it for the dividend and not necessarily for any kind of thermal coal price beta. Okay. Uh, so, and then uh, Thungela is interesting down here. I mean, there's been a lot of difficulty with the rail, uh, with the rail company, uh, Transnet down in South Africa. Um, you know, Thungela got down, got down here, you know, in May and we had a, you know, nice little run up of thermal coal prices and, and rail service got better. And, and now we're back down here at these levels. Like there, you know, this, this is one I would think about, like, if I want to play thermal coal, a spike in thermal coal prices, I'd probably start start looking down there, but you, you have to make sure that the rail is operating. If they can't, if they can't produce and get uh, product to market, you know, it's really, really not quite, uh, uh, not quite as interesting. Yeah. If they can't ship it, then it's not worth it. Again. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I put these two on the same chart because I thought this was really interesting. So this is Whitehaven and Peabody who are okay. effectively sort of like 50, 50 met thermal producers now. And look at this correlation. How about that? Yeah. Wow. So, so both of these, uh, you know, because they have thermal coal exposure, um, you know, Peabody is building a, uh, you know, a met coal mine. It's going to be really good quality in Australia. I think it'll do, you know, 200 to 300 million of free cash flow a year. Wow. Uh, it's going to be a good asset and the world needs it. Um, you know, whether they can, you know, execute it over time, I think, you know, probably yet to be seen. But um, these are these are the hybrids and the hybrids have sort of performed reasonably well together. As Whitehaven starts to... Um, uh, you know, realize the, the you know profit from Blackwater and Donia. I think I think this correlation is going to get tighter. Um, I, I think I think these guys are probably undervalued relative to where they should be. Okay, uh, if we're being fair. 
And you said they're about 50, 50 each as far as met and thermal. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 they're not quite 50, 50 on either side, but just for simplicity's sake. Yeah. It's uh, easy to remember. Yeah, split, not quite down the middle, but pretty close. Okay. Um, yeah. That's the universe. And then, you know, for the, the, the other interesting companies that are uh, right now, South Gobi resources actually issued a profit warning not long ago. <laughs> um, they're up 138% in three months, 30% over the past month. Um, and then uh, Mongolian Mining Corporation uh, is up pretty significantly here. Um, both of these both of these guys produce a little bit of MET. Um, South Gobi's is lower quality MET. It's semi-soft, uh, you know, higher volatile coal. Mongolian Mining Company uh, Corporation has one mine, Uka Kudog, which is very good quality coking coal, uh, kind of a low to a mid-volatile coal. Uh, you know, the rest of their production is kind of, you know, a mix of thermal and uh, lower quality, uh, even unwashed coal and stuff like that. But uh, Mongolia has been on the move because uh, they've been able to increase shipments into China. The more the more they increase shipments, the more their costs go down because you get economies of scale there. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then also the you know the price in, in China for for both men and thermal has been relatively, uh, relatively attractive. So, you know, these guys have had a, had a pretty good month. They're illiquid as hell. Um, okay. Uh, South Gobi is also traded on the on the Canadian exchange, though. I think it's SGQ. Um, you can see in a second if I type in SGQ. Yep, that's it. Okay. So you um, you you may you may be able to buy it, and you might not be able to sell it. <laughs> so yeah, set set those limit orders. Yeah, uh, exactly. but, no market orders. <laughs> yeah, but I you know I, I do think like the next few months are pretty interesting for Mongolia because I don't I don't, I don't think anybody's really digested just how much more money they're going to make, uh, sort of going forward. Um, the the other company I'd point out down here is uh, Natural Resource Partners, which is a royalty company. Hmm. Um. Oh, there's royalty uh, plays on coal. Yeah, so NRP uh, holds a lot of the the they hold a lot of the royalties for Alpha. They hold a, the, a lot of the royalties for Ramico. Uh, so they are the you know kind of like no risk way to kind of own uh, you know met coal uh, in the sector. Oh, they also have some timber and some some other uh, some other royalties which are pretty interesting, but uh, really well really well run company. Um, and, uh, you know, I forget what their yield is at the moment, but, um, it's, uh, this, if you're looking for royalties or, or a way to do that, this is the one you need to, uh, sort so of that's probably the thing. easiest beta way to play it right there. Uh, it, it might be, it's not going to, if you're going to play beta of met coal, you know, I think you play AMR and HCC. Okay. If you're going to play beta of thermal coal, I think you play console CEIX. Uh, and you could probably make a case for Thumgela, assuming Transnet is shipping, um, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, for for the for the more diversified guys, you know. BHP. I mean, you can see BHP really hasn't done much. Yeah. Uh, whereas here's Glencore. Glencore really hasn't done much. Yeah. So you're, you're not going to catch a whole lot of beta with the diversified South 32. Okay. Uh, you know, percent over the past three months. So it's. You know, really, you have to go for the pure plays or, or close to pure plays. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to really, you know, go after beta. But I don't, I don't think that's really necessary. I, th I think this has become more of a buy and hold sector. Okay. You know, like especially for the med guys, like they're they're free cash flowing. You know, over the next ten year, ten years, somewhere between twenty percent to one hundred percent of uh, you know of their market cap. So like. Why, why, why bother? You know, at that point in time, you can just yeah. you can just hold it, and they can use that cash to either return to you in dividends, or they can buy back shares like Alpha and Consol are doing. So I just, you know, I kind of, I kind of like look at this sector as compounders here over the, uh, you know, over the coming future, and um, you know whether that's through buybacks or through um, through dividends. Um, you know, I, I think this is this is a pretty, it's this is the weirdest thing to say, but it's a weirdly safe place to 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 allocate capital i'd allocate capital on pullbacks mind you i wouldn't, wouldn't allocate it you know when we're at all-time highs like we are now yeah but um but they're they're ones to keep on your radar and kind of you know accumulate going forward because I, I do think we're going to have a really good you know five years i think i think almost for sure but 10 years uh, you know possible decade of uh, being able to you know return 20 30 percent a year that is music to our ears, Matt. <laughs> Pun intended, since you're a musician. Yeah, yeah, <laughs>
<laughs> right on. Well, awesome. This has been amazing, Matt. Thank you very much. We would love to have you back on in, in, in a few months and, and just kind of catch up on the sector. If our listeners want to get a hold of you, uh, what is the best way to do that? Oh, best way to do that is on Twitter, just uh, at MF Warder. Uh, my middle name is Finley, uh, F-I-N-D-L-E-Y. So uh, M Warder was taken. I had to, had to throw the middle initial in there. But yeah, MF Warder, at MF Warder on Twitter. That's the best way to get a hold of me. I'm active on there all the time. I, you know, mostly just talk about cold air, but, uh, you know, the, you know, the group of, uh, uh, of mining Twitter guys, uh, we, we, we talk about all sorts of things. I'm, I'm pretty heavily invested in Cameco and, and Spud as well. Um, you know, there's the, the same sort of, you know, difficulties that plague coal plague almost the entire mining sector. So, you know, all of these stories are really analogous and it's just, um, uh, and it's a it's a great community of folks. I mean, we got a lot of really smart people who are very, very well in tune with. I mean, not just what's going on with the equities themselves, but also with you know global geopolitics and uh, you know policy and and those sorts of things. It's um yeah, it's it's been a great place to work here for twenty years. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Anyone who's interested in contacting you, we will put a link down in the show notes. And thank you for tuning in. Support the show. Hit the like, subscribe, and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.